Hello and welcome to the Dimensional Analysis Module. So uh, today we're going to start the module and start with just a general discussion. But uh, as we move through the various lectures within this module, we're going to talk about the general scaling and non-dimensionalization of the governing equations, specifically the Navier-Stokes equations. And we're going to rescale these equations with dimensionless parameters, which will result in dimensionless parameters. And those parameters will give us some insight as to what's going on, what terms dominate within the Navier-Stokes for a given flow field. Uh, so we're going to basically use the dimensionless parameters to characterize the Navier-Stokes. Then we're going to look at some kind of hand-waving dimensional analysis, some basic analysis of equations. Uh, my wife likes to tell me that uh, all of fluid mechanics can be solved just by getting the units right. And in a way, she's kind of right, and that's what we'll do in this section here, this part four. Just some general hand-waving to, uh, to try to come up with some simple solutions or guidance for the Navier-Stokes equations, which will then lead us to a more formal methodology known as Buckingham Pi or similarity methods or similitude. So this is, these are terms that if you go to look this stuff up in various books uh, that you might find all related to the same topic. So the objective of this lecture is just to non-dimensionalize the Navier-Stokes equations uh, just to get us started, to introduce the basic ideas behind scaling and characteristic lengths and characteristic parameters for uh, uh, given dependent variables. And then we're going to insert those uh, scaling parameters into the Navier-Stokes equations to see what happens. So let's get started. Here's the Navier-Stokes equations, the set we're going to work with, specifically uh, continuity and momentum. And you can see this is uh, we're assuming that this is a Newtonian fluid, um, so <clears throat> this is very appropriate for fluid mechanics. So let's get started. Let's start with the first parameter. Uh, the first independent variable we want to scale will be time. And so what we have here on the right-hand side of this equation is time is the, the regular old time. And then we're going to multiply this by some characteristic frequency, some characteristic frequency of the flow. Together, if you look at the units, that's 1 over time and frequency and time. So this dimensionless time here will denote with the asterisk, uh, the superscript asterisk. So that is our dimensionless time. And we can carry on uh, like this for a variety of parameters. So <clears throat> here's a flow field. This is flow over a circular cylinder. Uh, at high enough Reynolds numbers such that we get vortex shedding, which occurs at very regular intervals. So it's, there's this kind of embedded frequency within the flow field. And so it would be an obvious choice to pick this frequency as our characteristic frequency for this particular flow field. The next parameter, the next independent variable we'll non-dimensionalize might be the spatial variables x, y, z. And we'll non-dimensionalize them by some characteristic length, right? And in this case, that would be L. So what would be an appropriate characteristic length for this flow field? Well, in general, I think the one that jumps out at you is, is the diameter of the, of the cylinder here. So uh, we'll scale each one of the uh, independent variables associated with length by that. What about the velocity? So again, we've got dimensionless velocity here, and uh, we're going to get that by taking the regular velocity and dividing by some characteristic velocity. And I think the obvious choice for this flow field would just be, say, the free stream velocity of the uh, uh, upstream of the flow. Finally, we could dimensionalize the uh, density, non-dimensionalize the density, by the air density, let's say, or whatever fluid this is. So with these in mind, uh, we have a complete set of parameters and a complete set of variables associated with the continuity equation. So here's our continuity equation here. And you can see all of the parameters, uh, all of the independent and dependent variables within the continuity equation 
uh, have been non-dimensionalized above. So the way forward is to take this equation here, or any of these, and solve for the variable of interest. So in this case, we're looking at time. So time would be equal to the dimensionless time times or divided by that frequency, right? Uh, the spatial dimension x would be equal to the dimensionless x, x star times length, and the velocity would be equal to the dimensionless velocity times the characteristic velocity. So we can take these and insert them directly into here. So we can, here's time, I'll just insert this time right into that equation and so forth. <clears throat> so when I do that, I insert the non-dimensional scaling factors, I get this equation here. So you can check me on that to make sure I did that right, but uh, that's what we typically get. Now these parameters that we're using, these characteristic parameters are constants, so in general they can be factored out of the operations, partial partial t and the spatial derivatives. So we can simplify, like uh, I see here that every term has a row infinity in it, so I can get rid of those guys. It looks like uh, I could probably pull out the V infinities and the L's, and when I did that, I would, I would be left with this equation right here. So notice that the uh, spatial derivatives don't have any of the characteristic parameters in them. They're just the uh, independent variables on the top being operated on by the, uh, I'm sorry, the dependent variables on top being operated on by the independent variables in the bottom. Now we do have a collection of terms that we gathered together, this L times F over uh, the uh, characteristic velocity. And so we can rewrite the continuity equation uh, recognizing that that dimensionless group is actually the Struhal number. So it's important to recognize that it is a dimensionless group. See, uh, F has units of 1 over time, so like 1 over seconds. The length is like a, a meters over meters per second. So you can see that's a dimensionless group on its own. So each term within that set, uh, uh, each term within that equation set is itself dimensionless. So there's something going on here with the Struhal number. It's scaling the, uh, the derivative partial rho partial t. So you can imagine that if the diameter of that cylinder got really large, it would make the Struhal number get very large. And maybe uh, if the diameter got small, it would make the Struhal number get small, and you can play this game with, uh, with all of the variables. But it, it gives us an insight as to what the uh, what the relative importance of that term is. If the Struhal number is very, very small relative to these other groups, one would imagine that perhaps that uh, time variation is not very important for this flow. So these terms do not contain a dimensionless group, as I mentioned before. Here's a plot of the Struhal number as a function of Reynolds number. This is for the flow that I showed earlier, the flow over a circular cylinder with vortex shutting. And you can see that over a huge range of Reynolds number for, for several decades, when shedding just begins about right here, so this is where shedding starts, the Struhal number quickly rises up to a value of about 0.2 for a smooth sphere, and it stays there for about three decades until the shedding becomes uh, turbulent. And then uh, at that point, uh, I should say that the, uh, uh, the boundary layer on the uh, circular cylinder becomes turbulent. At that point, you get some variation within the, the, the Struhal number. And for roughness, uh, you get something quite similar. So it's rather interesting because it means that if I had to guess what the Struhal number is for any flow, such as flow behind a bus or flow over a stop sign, I might guess a Struhal number of 0.2. So in a way, you can see I've scaled all flows within that Reynolds number range. That's the basic idea behind dimensional analysis. Here's another very different way of looking at, uh, looking at things. This is, a, this is kind of a graph showing birds here flapping flight and swimming critters. So we got birds that fly and fish that swim. And here's a list of all of the birds and fish and so forth. And if you take their wing flapping rate, the frequency at which they flap their wings, 
and uh, calculate the Struhall number as uh, using some characteristic length of the bird, which turns out to be the length, and their flight velocity. And you do this for a variety of birds and bats and insects even, so over a huge scale range of flying critters, you see that their Struhall number is about 0.3-ish or so, which is really rather interesting that all these animals non-dimensionalize in some way. So if I was trying to build some machine, some large machine that would flap, I would imagine that it might be a good idea for me to match that Struhall number that the flapping rate of my machine should coincide with that of birds and insects and things that actually do fly. Same goes with the fish here, it's interesting. So here the, uh, the frequency was the, how fast they wiggle their, their tails, their bodies, in the case of an eel, and uh, their length is their body length, and again, it non-dimensionalizes. So there's something fundamental built into to, uh, uh, mechanisms of flight and mechanisms of swimming associated with this magic Struhall number of 0.3, in the same way that there's something going on here with a Struhall number of 0.2 for bluff bodies. So, what about an alternate uh, scaling for the continuity equation? You know, when we uh, did this here, we had a frequency. We introduced, basically, when we introduced the frequency, we introduced a time scaling, right? When I introduced length, I introduced a length scaling. However, when I introduced velocity, I kind of overspecified things here. Why wouldn't, it, it, it seems more obvious that the characteristic velocity would just be related, that these two things should be actually equal, right? So when I pick this characteristic velocity, I shouldn't necessarily pick the free stream velocity because I've already picked uh, a quintessential length and a time scale for this flow. So I should stick to that, right? And if I do that, I would really be scaling time in this way, right? So what if I rescale the continuity equation with this particular time scale and scheme? What would happen? I would plug in my factors, and you can see almost right away that <clears throat> everything cancels here, all right? So all of the parameters cancel, and I'm left with a an equation in which all the characteristic lengths dropped out. This is the more famous result that you see for the continuity equation, that the continuity equation has in it no built-in scaling factor, that uh, for this particular set of parameters, which seems very fair uh, <clears throat> for a general flow, that uh, the scaling factors uh, or the continuity equation is unaffected by uh, how I scale the problem. Rather interesting, don't you think? What about momentum? Let's go back to this one where we're going to where we're going to have kind of two times so that uh, we get a Struhall number again. Now, with momentum, uh, unlike continuity, pressure appears, so we're going to need a, uh, a dimensionless scheme for pressure, and we'll say that the pressure minus the far field pressure is non-dimensionalized by the pressure difference between the static pressure and the far field pressure. That's fair enough. The, uh, the gradient, del, will be non-dimensionalized by the length, the same length that we uh, used when we non-dimensionalized uh, the spatial variables. And then we'll just introduce some gravitational constant. It could be maybe an acceleration. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be gravity. It could be a characteristic acceleration of the flow field. So using this scheme, we could insert uh, these guys into the, the momentum equation. And I think what I'll do is leave that up to you. This would be a great time for you to pause and have a cup of coffee and see if you couldn't do this yourself. And um, so we'll let you try that, a little coffee zeit, a little coffee time. And uh, when you do that, you should get something that looks like this. And so you can see that there are dimensionless parameters all over the place here. I'll point them out. I've already factored them out for the most part. So there they are. And then we can collect these, or they're already collected. We can recognize them for what they are. There are they are very famous dimensionless groups within the world of fluid mechanics. And here they are, here. The Struhall number, which we've already talked about. The Euler number, here. The Reynolds number. And the Froude number, or the Froude number. Notice this nonlinear advection didn't end up with 
a preceding packet of dimensionless or characteristic parameters. So that's rather interesting. So as we've already talked about, this is the definition of the Struhall number. Here's the Euler number, which is really just the dimensionless pressure uh, divided by, or the, uh, the, the pressure change divided by the dynamic pressure. And it's common in the world of fluid mechanics to report pressure uh, non-dimensionalized by the dynamic pressure. So it's the static and far field pressure over the dynamic pressure. So it's pressure over pressure. So again, the Euler number, like all of these dimensionless parameters, should be dimensionless. The Reynolds number uh, you're very familiar with. It's the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. Uh, this is a typical way to present it here. And finally, this Froude number, the Froude number, uh, is the ratio of inertial forces to gravity forces, or more generally, kinetic energy over potential energy. And so this is the, the dimensionless group here. All right, so that's a basic introduction to what dimensionless uh, analysis is. Is it dimensionless analysis or dimensional analysis? I'm, I'm not really sure, but you see either way uh, seems appropriate. Uh, next time we're going to look at that momentum equation a, a, a bit further and talk about parameters and uh, how we can use those parameters for a given flow field to determine what terms are important and what terms are not important within the Navier-Stokes equation. All right, so until next time, uh, have fun. See you later.